My name is Brittany Whiters, and I am the CEO and co-founder of Canna Health Digital Magazine, which is an online free quarterly publication that emphasizes knowledge, safe access, and advocacy. And today, I have the very great privilege of speaking with Dr. Edwin McDonald, who is going to talk to us about a healthy gut and how cannabis can be involved in that process of creating a healthy gut and also creating healthy um, patterns to help our gut. So Dr. McDonald, thank you so much for joining us. Um, I know that you have been um, probably busy with this whole COVID-19 going on. So we definitely yeah. appreciate your time. Well, it's definitely a pleasure to be here. And uh, yeah, you know, I've been in the ER working with a lot of COVID patients, but this is also very important. And I think uh, right now is a great time to have a conversation about cannabis. And, you know, despite COVID taking over our healthcare system and hospitals in general, like there are still a lot of other issues that people are experiencing. And I think cannabis can play a role uh, in addressing some of the symptoms of those issues. But nonetheless, I'm ready to get into it and talk about them. So I have Dr. Edwin McDonald here, who is a board certified GI doctor um, with over 12 years dedicated to helping patients with GI issues. He also has a weight management clinic where he helps people talk about um, better nutrition. Dr. McDonald is also affiliated with the University of Chicago Hospital as their Associate Director of Adult Clinical Nutrition and an Assistant Professor of Medicine. So again, thank you, Dr. McDonald, for joining us today. So the first question that I have for you is, how does um, cannabis actually create homeostasis or balance within the um, endocannabinoid system? Yeah. So let's talk about the endocannabinoid system or cannabinoid system. Um, we all have um, cannabinoids that our body produces. Um, so we produce natural cannabinoids that can impact the way our gut functions, that can impact our mood, um, that can make us feel chill, make us feel anxious depending on what's going on. Um, and also our endocannabinoid system uh, can affect, you know, our, our sensitivity to pain or tolerance to pain, and all, it also may play a role in inflammation. So, in terms of when that system is imbalanced, um, there are some examples where we may be producing too much uh, of our own cannabinoids, and that can lead to imbalances that can manifest themselves as symptoms. So, one good example would be uh, weight gain. So there are a lot of different studies that have found that uh, a lack of balance uh, between the type of cannabinoids that our body's producing can potentially increase our risk for gaining weight or make us more susceptible to gaining weight. Um, one way you can uh, find a better, better balance or, or change the balance or address any imbalances um, is using uh, actual cannabis products. So CBD, um, is basically, CBD oil can basically block uh, some of the cannabinoid receptors. Um, so, and whereas THC can activate some of the cannabinoid, cannabinoid receptors. So when you use a combination of THC and CBD, or some of, sometimes individually, that may help bring a better balance to this endocannabinoid system. So then you, you had mentioned um, how the, cannabinoid receptors can be blocked or they can be like upregulated. So tell us in what circumstances when dealing with the gut would we want that to be upregulated or when we would want that to be suppressed? So there's two types of uh, cannabinoid receptors. Uh, so you have your CB1 and CB2. So CB1 is mostly located within the brain and neurologic tissues, uh, such as nerves, uh, whereas CB2 is located in a lot of our bodily organs, uh, especially the intestines, uh, the organs of which I, I deal with as a gastrointestinal doctor. So it, it's, it's complicated. So it, it's hard to really say when uh, the CB or the receptor should be upregulated or our endogenous cannabinoids, uh, cannabinoids should be upregulated or not, because we don't really have a lot of testing 
um, in our clinics to say, well, you know, there's an imbalance. So whenever we have conversations about uh, imbalances as far as uh, the endocannabinoid system, it, 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 it's hard because we don't have the clinical studies to actually say what's really going on. Mm-hmm. So in theory, uh, when people have anxiety or where people may uh, be overeating, uh, one part of those conditions could be part of this imbalance. And um, when people try medical cannabis, um, and depending on the strain, it may affect that imbalance. But it's hard um, to predict what effect that those what, that using cannabis really has, because at this point we're not doing the studies on checking levels for the endogenous cannabinoids that the body makes. So it's hard for me to really say exactly what's going on. Uh, but we do know that there's conditions where there may potentially be this imbalance. And realistically, when we're seeing patients, a lot of times when we suspect that an imbalance may occur, the best treatment or even the best way to diagnose it is by actually uh, having people use cannabis and see how they respond to it. Um, so if people are, you, you know, say overeating, um, there's actually a medication um, that was used as a weight loss medication for a while. Uh, and it was all just based off CBD oil, um, except they modified it and, and put it in a pill form. But at the end of the day, it, it blocked uh, some of the cannabinoid receptors and a lot of people lost weight. Um, and there's definitely been studies where people are looking at using CBD oil or even THC as a way to modify weight to some degree. Um, does that answer everything? Yes. <laughs> okay. Yes, it did. Um, <clears throat> so that actually leads me into another question. Um, then if we don't, if you don't have enough studies um, in your clinic to really say if it needs to be upregulated or it needs to be suppressed, then how do you go about with dosing a patient when they come to you and they have some sort of gut imbalance, then um, you tell them to, okay, maybe you should take cannabis to see what effect you have, but then how do you dose that? How do you, um, I guess, individ- individualize that to that patient, individ- individualize that treatment to that patient? Yeah, no, it, it is. That is a, that's a great question. And it's tough. And I think realistically, as a clinician, that may vary depending on what state you're in and how long those states have had uh, legalized medical cannabis. So in certain states, uh, California, Colorado, uh, they've had medical cannabis longer than they've, they've had it in here in Illinois. And in those states, you have growers who uh, are growing a variety of different strains. So I think uh, some of the states where cannabis have been legalized for a little bit longer, uh, I, have, I as a physician would have more options in terms of tailoring uh, specifically uh, a strain uh, with a condition. Whereas in certain states where cannabis has become newly legalized, we still have a little bit ways to go in terms of playing catch up. But ideally, yes, we should be able to personalize medical cannabis in terms of deciding how much we should give uh, to some one person specifically based upon what symptoms and or conditions they have. And right now it's tough. And the reason for that is is because, one, for many years, it was almost illegal to do uh, cannabis-related medical research. Mm-hmm. And even in states where it is legal, you still have the stigma attached that exists within the kind of research community to some degree. That stigma is changing, but, you know, we're still dealing with the remnants of the stigma. And as a result, a lot of the studies that need to get done to answer some of these questions have not been done or they're being done currently. So what the average uh, physician will do, especially a physician in a state where medical cannabis is new, uh, we really encourage people to do what's known as microdosing, where if you're doing CBD oil, we start kind of lower and then slowly kind of work our way up to the point where people start to feel kind of a symptomatic relief. And I would say the same thing applies to people doing edible uh, cannabis and also people who are smoking cannabis. Um, So 
for me, based upon uh, someone's age, uh, someone's experience with cannabis in the past, and so a lot of my uh, patients, you know, I see people who may be 80 years old, and they may not necessarily have ever smoked cannabis. Mm -hmm. Uh, So for that older person who also is cannabis naive, I'm not going to tell them to, you know, go out and do a full dropper's worth of CBD. Uh, And it also depends on what type of brand they're getting, because with CBD, you know, not all droppers are dosed the same. Mm -hmm. Um, So I really, if people are going to dispensaries, I have to rely on some of my bud tenders to help out with that education process. Um, And as a result, I've actually visited a lot of dispensaries here in Chicago to specifically Mm -hmm. Uh, develop a relationship with a lot of the blood tenders to really know what information they're giving my patients, um, but also to know and understand what conditions a lot of patients have. So case in point, you know, I've had patients who have, uh, you know, have lung cancer um, and they've had COPD, uh, which is basically uh, emphysema from lung cancer where they have difficulty breathing. Mm -hmm. Uh, So for those patients, a lot of smoke can essentially cause a COPD exacerbation. Cigarette smoke, marijuana smoke, uh, if you are barbecuing too much and they hail smoke from the grill, mm-hmm. uh, like that smoke can send somebody to the hospital. So I've seen um, dispensaries, you know, recommend that people smoke, but they don't necessarily know that this person has that condition. Um, so one of the reasons why I go into dispensaries is to really help uh, educate some of the people at the dispensaries about the actual conditions. Uh, And I also tell my patients, you know, there are certain uh, conditions that are more beneficial for edible cannabis compared to smoking cannabis Mm -hmm. um, because the bioavailability, the amount of cannabis that actually gets into our body, into our system, is going to vary depending on the route we consume it. Uh, And not only the amount, but also how quickly it gets distributed to our body um, versus, you know, some forms are going to be quicker. Other forms are going to be a little bit later. Um, And then at some point, we'll talk about the microbiome. It's, you know, inhaling cannabis versus ingesting cannabis, the effects on the microbiome may not necessarily be the same uh, just because the route of ingestion is different. So most of my practice, um, before I even get into microdosing, I really start with should this person uh, be inhaling cannabis uh, or this person, should this person be ingesting cannabis? And that decision is going to depend on uh, what's going on with their gut and other medical conditions they may have. And then once I, uh, and also their experience with, um, you know, eating cannabis or, or smoking cannabis, because mm-hmm. again, in a state like Illinois, where medical cannabis or even recreational cannabis is still relatively new, uh, I see a lot of people with a lot of different experience in the past in terms of cannabis use. So there are some people that are more accustomed to smoking and, you know, know everything there is to know about smoking. And there's other people who've never done it before ever. And they, you know, there's a learning curve that uh, unfortunately in the clinic, it's hard to, it's hard to demonstrate certain things in the clinic because, uh, you know, we're just not there yet in terms of the acceptance of medical cannabis. Right. Uh, we, sh- we should be there. Yeah. Like I should be able to, you know, in my clinic, show people exactly what to do. Uh, and in, in, in maybe specialty clinics, they have people like that. But I think in the general healthcare system, that's a work in progress. Mm-hmm. Um, but once we have a conversation in terms of whether or not people should inhale um, versus uh, use edible cannabis, and then there's certain conditions where people want to do topical cannabis, where you're kind of rubbing oil on your joints and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. Uh, so there's a time and place for that, too. But after that, the conversation really becomes uh, microdosing, and I tell people uh, about side effects potentially if they take too much. So I guess this would probably be based uh, a little bit more individualized, but I mean, the common thread between cannabis and um, wellness is really being individualized, where you're always individualizing um, what wellness looks for that patient, what wellness looks like for that patient. So yeah. in what terms, I, um, 
in what situations, what conditions would smoking cannabis be healthier for the gut rather than ingesting or what circumstances or what um, conditions where ingestion would be better than um, smoking? So for me as a gastroenterologist, I use cannabis in a couple different situations. So one, uh, in inflammatory conditions that can affect intestines. Two, when people have uh, issues with nausea and vomiting. Uh, so a lot of my cancer patients who are on chemotherapy or may have bowel obstructions because cancer is blocking their intestines. Uh, and then people who have just chronic abdominal pain. So this would be people with irritable bowel syndromes or other conditions that can be associated with pain. Um, when people have inflammation of their intestines, uh, that can impact their ability to absorb not only nutrients, but also medications, which cannabis would fall under that category. So I see a lot of people who have inflammatory bowel disease. There's basically two forms of inflammatory bowel disease. You have Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis. So Crohn's disease predominantly affects the small intestine where most of our uh, nutrients are absorbed and also our colon. Uh, and ulcerative colitis really just affects the colon. It doesn't really affect the intestine. Now, both of these conditions can manifest themselves as having a lot of abdominal pain and a lot of diarrhea. So specifically in Crohn's disease, if the small bowel is severely inflamed, your body's not going to be able to absorb uh, anything that you eat for the most part, and that would include edible cannabis. So in that patient population, it may be more reasonable to actually uh, inhale the cannabis as opposed to eating it. Um, but it really depends on, again, the degree of inflammation within someone's intestines. So that, that really is a personalized approach. So me making that decision, I'm looking over their previous endoscopies, uh, which are the camera tests that we do where we take pictures and biopsies throughout the intestine. Uh, people may have CT scans that can show me how uh, inflamed their intestine is and where the inflammation is located. But looking through some of those studies can help guide me in terms of whether or not someone should use edible cannabis versus inhaling cannabis. Now, um, in someone who has irritable bowel syndrome, so irritable bowel syndrome is a condition that's very common uh, where people have uh, either constipation or intermittent diarrhea or both where people go back and forth and it can be associated. Uh, man, I hit the table again. It's okay. Um, yeah. So I also treat people with irritable bowel syndrome, which is a little bit different than inflammatory uh, bowel disease. So IBS, for sure, irritable bowel syndrome is a condition um, in which people have a lot of abdominal pain, uh, gas and bloating, and maybe even some diarrhea or some constipation, or sometimes people can have both. So with irritable bowel syndrome, there also can be an anxiety or an emotional component to irritable bowel syndrome. So for some of my patients who have irritable bowel syndrome, especially if they also have underlying anxiety or stress-related uh, irritable bowel syndrome, and it doesn't necessarily have to be anxiety that's, uh, you know, debilitating. I don't, want think to, I don't want people to think that you have to have a mental illness to have irritable bowel syndrome, but it's really just the everyday anxiety that people experience and everyday stress that people experience that also can affect our bowels. Um, for those, for people with irritable bowel syndrome, I may be more inclined to encourage uh, inhaling um, cannabis as opposed to ingesting it. But again, it's something that's really personalized. And so it depends on whether or not people have other conditions uh, like asthma. So if someone has severe asthma and irritable bowel syndrome, inhaling cannabis may not necessarily be the greatest thing for the asthma, whereas ingesting, it would probably be a safer route. Because the last thing I want for anyone is to experience any side effects or complications for something I give them. And that applies to not only cannabis, but applies to medications in general. So for me, I'm, I look at cannabis the same way I look at medications. And the downside is that um, our pharmacies or dispensaries, they're not on the same level as pharmacies. Um, so if I call a pharmacist, I could tell them exactly what dose or her exactly what dose, uh, what route. I write everything on a prescription pad, and they know exactly what I'm saying. There's a standardized form of communication uh, to, for me to communicate with the pharmacist. In Illinois, we don't have that standardized communication that exists for me to communicate with a blood tender. 
uh, for me to explicitly say this is what I want for this patient and these reasons. Um, and I think we'll probably get there. Uh, and honestly, it's one of those things that um, I'm trying to reach out to the director of Illinois Department of Public Health to really uh, make sure we set that in place. Because I, I think in order to personalize the cannabis, we have to have a better way to actually communicate with bud tenders so people can know exactly what I want for each specific patient. Mm -hmm. But uh, right now it just, it, it just doesn't exist that way. Mm -hmm. And I, I think it will change, but it, it just takes time. Mm -hmm. And in general, when I have patients who have uh, anxiety or or pain where you may need relief immediately, um, those would be situations where I would encourage smoking as opposed to uh, eating cannabis, mm -hmm. primarily because for someone's in pain, I mean, if you're really in pain, like you want to get, you want to feel better quickly. You don't want to necessarily wait for your body to actually digest the cannabis and absorb it. Um, like it will still make people feel better potentially, but it's just going to be, it's going to take a longer period of time. And I, and I do feel like uh, when it comes to micro dosing, um, it's easier to, you know, have people kind of give THC and smoke THC as opposed to uh, the edible stuff, because one, everyone's digestion is a little bit different. Uh, you know, things take longer in certain people and less long in other people. Um, so it's a little bit harder to control. And uh, whereas uh, smoking cannabis, I do feel like people would be more in tune in terms of how their body's reacting to it because the reaction is going to be, you know, relatively quicker as opposed to this delayed reaction. Mm -hmm. And then I, I've also seen a lot of people who are naive to cannabis who uh, made the mistake of eating too much cannabis and, and they've had an, a negative experience. And it wasn't because of... Um, the cannabis itself is just they, they ate too much and they didn't they didn't really give their body enough time to absorb it so once they started absorbing it um they almost kind of overdosed to some degree mm -hmm. um so no one's had any you know any medical problems that came from that it's just that it wasn't an enjoyable experience and they felt nausea and, and, and stuff like that so <clears throat> you had mentioned um that in some instances that you would uh, recommend smoking the cannabis for like faster relief. Um, so is there a specific way in which you would recommend smoking? Um, are we talking about just like lighting up a joint or are we talking about vaping? You know, there has been a lot of controversy with vaping. Um, yeah. Or I know that some people like just do like a natural kind of inhalant of cannabis, like smoking the herb? Yeah. Uh, it, so, it, you know, it's complicated. <laughs> mm -hmm. And again, I, I think this is an area that needs further study in terms of um, what effect the smoke have on the lungs in general. Mm -hmm. um, so looking at data from tobacco and marijuana or cannabis and tobacco are very different. And they've even done studies where they looked at uh, rates of lung cancer in tobacco smokers versus cannabis smokers. And the rates were actually uh, way lower in the cannabis smokers compared to tobacco. Uh, so there's something that's unique about tobacco in terms of posing a risk for lung cancer. But, you know, in general, we still have a long way to go to define how safe smoke is to some degree. Right. Um, so one of the reasons why cannabis uh, is associated with decreased risk of lung cancer is that, you know, the actual uh, cannabinoids within cannabis may have anti-cancer properties. Um, so we, it may offer some protection that kind of protects us against uh, some of the ill health effects associated with smoke. Uh, but it's, it's still an area of ongoing research. So with that said, whenever I talk to people about uh, smoking, I tend to encourage uh, forms of inhaling cannabis that are associated with less smoke, if you will. Um, so the vaping, uh, as long as the um, 
actual uh, components of vaping are safe, uh, I'm fine with people vaping, but you just have to be careful with what you're using to vape. Because if you're getting like bootleg stuff, there's a lot of people who've got sick, um, not from the actual cannabis, but from the chemicals within uh, what they're using to vape itself. And, and I've seen people in the hospital where, I mean, really sick. I think there was a, a young kid um, who was vaping. He wasn't vaping cannabis. He was vaping uh, tobacco. Uh, but he came into the University of Chicago severely sick uh, to the point where, uh, I mean, he was not only one kid, but like multiple kids, teenagers uh, that were in our ICU for, you know, a long, long period of time. Um, and it wasn't just at our institution. It was very common for a lot of young people to come in with these vaping injuries all over the country. Um, so I, I do, um, whenever I tell people to vape, I, I, you know, tell people to really only get stuff from reliable sources as opposed to just stuff from who knows where. Um, so for me, whenever I'm ed educating people, like I'm literally like, okay, this is the website in which you go to, like, when you go to the dispensary, this is what you ask for. Uh, be careful with this product, or this is how you recognize a knockoff or something like that. Um, and I, you know, since this is all relatively new, this is something that us physicians, we actually need better education on ourselves. Um, because, you know, 10 years ago, five years ago, nobody was really talking about vaping injuries. But within the past two or three years, like, it's a thing. Um, so it, it's really a, an ongoing area of research. And honestly, it's something that the FDA uh, has been involved in and should probably get more involved in because we should be able to do this safely without putting ourselves at any extra risk. Another re reason I, I encourage um, smoking versus edibles, uh, people have nausea. So if you have nausea and vomiting, um, especially if you're undergoing chemotherapy or you have a bowel obstruction because of a cancer, then smoking is really going to be, you, you know, your only option. Uh, or, you know, there's sublingual drops that you can use. Um, but if you're just kind of ingest cannabis and wait for your body to digest it and you're already nauseous, like most people are just going to vomit it up. So mm -hmm. in that setting, I definitely would encourage uh, other routes than just using your traditional edible. So how does cannabis affect the microbiome and what, what, what is that? Can you explain that yeah. to, to okay. the lay people, people who aren't honestly in the GI hole because I'm not even in, you know, GI and I'm an RN. I'm yeah. we're more so talking about like ventilation all the time. Gotcha. Gotcha. So the microbiome is important. The microbiome is really, uh, the gut microbiome specifically, is the combination of bacteria that we have living in our gastrointestinal tract. Uh, and most of the bacteria live in the colon, but there's bacteria throughout our entire intestines. Um, it's really amazing because um, the number of bacteria that exists within our colon, it actually uh, outnumbers the number of human cells that we have throughout our entire body. So there's more bacteria cells in our colon than there's human cells in our entire body, uh, which is amazing. And there's actually more bacteria DNA, DNA within our, the bacteria within our colon than there's human DNA within our entire body. So recently, uh, people have realized that the bacteria that live in our gut, they're just not sitting there just doing nothing, kind of minding their own business. They're interacting with us. So mm -hmm. they can interact with our nervous system, the nerves of the gut. They can produce uh, what's known as neurotransmitters. These are chem chemicals that uh, our brain uses to kind of communicate with our nerves, and it can affect the way our brain works. So one major neurotransmitter is called serotonin, and majority of the serotonin in our body is actually produced by the bacteria within the gut. Uh, and this can have implications in terms of depression, in terms of uh, schizophrenia, in terms of a lot of uh, mental illness, and not only mental illness, but just our mood in general. Um, the bacteria can play a role. So... With cannabis, um, there have been some studies that have demonstrated um, that cannabis can potentially affect the 
com combination or composition of the bacteria that we have within our gut. So ultimately, um, a lot of times when people talk about the microbiome, everyone wants to have a conversation about good bacteria versus bad bacteria. Uh, and it's a little bit more complicated than that. Right now, I think we do have a lot to learn about the microbiome, but one thing that seems fairly clear is that having a diverse amount of bacteria within your gut is associated with uh, well-being or wellness or being healthy. So there's been a lot of studies where they looked at people with diabetes, people with colon cancer, people with a lot of different chronic conditions, and they found that their gut bacteria is less diverse than people who don't have those conditions. Um, and one of the ways in which we can diversify our bacteria, the most powerful way to diversify your bacteria is really the food that you eat. It's not taking a probiotic. It's not, you know, doing special gut health enzymes that you get from the health food store. It's really just everyday food. And the foods that are the most powerful for affecting the gut microbiome and increasing diversity, uh, it's not just one food, it's a combination of food. And these are really plant-based foods. So there was a study that looked at uh, how much fruits and vegetables or plant-based products people are eating uh, and how it affects the diversity of the, the, the microbiome or the gut bacteria. The study found that people who ate uh, at least 30 different, 33 different types of plants throughout the week were way more diverse in their gut bacteria than people who only ate like, you know, zero to five. And uh, the plants that they looked at in the study weren't just, you know, fruits and vegetables and spinach and whatnot. There's also uh, different herbs and spices. Um, so thyme was included, rosemary, anything that basically came from a plant. Mm -hmm. So with cannabis, uh, oftentimes people forget that it's a plant. <laughs> right. Like, like right. cannabis is, a, it's a vegetable. Um, so it's a vegetable that has fiber that has, you know, it, it does not only have, you know, THC and cannabinoids in it. It has, you know, it's a green leafy vegetable. So it has a lot of phytonutrients or plant-based nutrients mm -hmm. that you would expect to see in other green leafy vegetables. Mm -hmm. So in that sense, ingesting it, you know, potentially can modify our microbiome, but, it, you know, it wouldn't necessarily micro modify the microbiome by itself. It really is going to be dependent on the pattern in which people are eating too. Um, so for people who are looking to modify their microbiome, I wouldn't just rely solely on cannabis or rely solely on a probiotic. I emphasize looking at your overall pattern of eating. Uh, you have to eat a variety of fruits and vegetables and foods that have fiber if you want to have uh, diverse bacteria. Because ultimately, the fiber that we eat, we don't digest fiber well. So all, those, all that fiber that we don't digest, it basically gets down into your colon where the bacteria live. And the bacteria can then digest the fiber that you didn't really eat well. So mm -hmm. in order to have a diverse set of bacteria, you actually have to feed your bacteria. And you feed them by eating foods that you don't digest well. Now, the standard American diet is super duper low in fiber. Uh, and one of the reasons why we're starting to see more chronic disease popping up is really because of the foods that we're eating. Uh, it, it, the foods may not contribute to increase in diversity of the gut background, but the, the gut microbiome, they actually decrease the diversity in the standard American diet. So all the junk food, the processed foods, it potentially can make your uh, gut bacteria less diverse. And then, um, you know, there's also concerns about, um, you, you know, ingesting antibiotics, and, and maybe even pesticide exposure, how those pesticides that are on the foods that we eat can also affect the gut bacteria. And same with antibiotics that are within some of the meat that we eat. And so there's a little bit of antibiotic residue that we could be potentially exposing ourselves. And that also can affect the type of bacteria that we have. So, you know, this is an area that's really complicated. Um, and right now, uh, one of the best ways outside of eating to modify our, our gut bacteria is really doing what's known as a stool transplant. And that's something that's actually mm -hmm. FDA approved for certain conditions. So there's one condition called C. difficile, which is a severe, uh, it can cause a severe inflammation or colitis, inflammation of the colon, and people have been exposed to antibiotics or people who uh, kind of, you know, are in hospitals or live in nursing homes where there's other people around who may be sick or may be on antibiotics themselves. 
So that condition uh, is treatable with actually taking bacteria from a healthy person and putting it into that uh, person who's dealing with the condition, and we call that a stool transplant. So I do stool transplants all the time for people with C. difficile, and the way we do it, we actually have a donor stool. Uh, so just like you have blood donors who have to get screened, we have people who are stool donors that have to get screened for the same thing. So screen for HIV, screen for, you know, AIDS, um, what else, hepatitis C, hepatitis B, et cetera, all the, you know, conditions that we can pass on through our blood. We don't want to pass that on to anybody through the stool. So we screen for those things. But since we know that diabetes, uh, weight gain, uh, depression can all be linked to the bacteria that we have in our gut, uh, we also have to screen people for those conditions. So you really have to be the healthiest of the healthy in order to be a stool donor. And once we get the stool, um, we get the stool from um, a place called Open Biome, uh, which is kind of a, you know, you've heard of blood banks. Open biome is more or less a, a stool bank. Stool bank. And a stool bank, yeah, people deposit <laughs> stool there. <laughs> um, so we get stool from there because uh, we know they pre-screen everything and they go through this rigorous process. And I basically, during a colonoscopy, uh, can thaw out the stool and put it in a liquid form and basically just squirt the stool, stool in, the, in the colon during a colonoscopy. And that's how you do a stool transplant. So that's probably one of the most effective ways of changing someone's microbiome, but it, it's tough. Even with those changes, uh, over time, you know, people, their gut bacteria always wants to go back to what the, the bacteria was before. So even with a stool transplant, the diet is really important because you really want to maintain this healthy bacteria. You got to feed it. It's almost like, it's like, you know, buying a new plant. Uh, if you don't water the plant, it's going to die. It doesn't matter if it's new or not. You still have to take care of it. But what else can I, can I um, use to determine whether I have good gut, gut health or not just by, you know, being an everyday person and going through yeah. everything? How can I determine? So that? great question. So I tell people um, your bowel movements should fall into the range of what's normal. Okay. So there's a lot of misconceptions in terms of what's normal. So a lot of times people think that, oh, you have to go every day or you have to go twice a day. Uh, normal is a range, okay? So based upon a, a large study that was actually done here in the United States where they looked at thousands of people uh, in the U.S. and had them kind of write down how many bowel movements they were having and what the consistency was like, they found that the range of uh, normal ranged from having uh, three bowel movements per day to three bowel movements per week. So most people fall in that category. And if you're in that category and you're not having any pain, you're not having blood in your stool, uh, you're not having uh, severe gas and bloating where it's bothersome, like your gut is probably okay. Um, now, your gut could be healthier. Uh, you can have all those things and have an unhealthy diet, and that's probably not making your gut as healthy as it could be at, on a cellular level or even in terms of having a diverse uh, bacteria in your gut. So we don't really have uh, the testing to test how diverse the bacteria are in your gut. Um, but ideally, if you have a healthy diet that is rich in fiber uh, and you don't necessarily have some of these symptoms, your gut's probably doing okay. Um, now, the next thing that people can look at to determine whether or not their gut is healthy, um, definitely not only how well their uh, bowels are functioning, but also symptoms. So yes, um, bloating is a common symptom. And uh, previously, I did mention that some bloating is normal. But for people who have bloating where it's associated with pain, um, that could indicate that a gut may not necessarily be as healthy uh, as possible. Or if you've eliminated a lot of the common causes of bloating and you're still having a lot of bloating, that in and of itself could be a sign that the gut may not necessarily be healthy. So the common causes of bloating would include, uh, if you look at foods, uh, milk would be one, uh, a lot of artificial sweeteners. So your diet drinks and uh, your diet foods that have fake sugars can potentially cause a lot of bloating. And um, gum has a lot of artificial sweeteners, so, so chewing gum can contribute to bloating. And then um, 
you know, those would probably be the most common ones. And uh, there's also some people who uh, don't tolerate fructose well. So we call that fructose mm -hmm. intolerance. Mm -hmm. So nowadays it's high fructose corn, corn syrup everywhere. Uh, so a lot of people may inhale or, I'm sorry, drink um, foods that have high fructose corn syrup in it and also have a lot of, uh, a lot of bloating. So typically I tell people just eliminate like all those common culprits. And then if you're still having symptoms, then maybe it's something to do with your gut health as opposed mm -hmm. to just the food causes. Mm -hmm. um, and then, you know, obviously looking for blood in the stool would be one uh, that could be a sign that there may be some issues with the structural integrity of the gut. So mm -hmm. if the lining of the intestines um, is kind of, if there's an ulcer or if the lining is impacted, that can also cause bleeding. Majority of bleeding that people experience uh, comes from hemorrhoids, which uh, is really just related to constipation for the most part. But there's other forms of bleeding that can indicate that there's something wrong with the gut. I mean, even cancer can present itself as blood in the stool. Yeah. So uh, for people who do have uh, symptoms that we don't explain by uh, modifying their diet or if there's definitely blood in the stool and we're concerned that the structure of the gut's impacted, that's when we start doing colonoscopies to actually look and see what's going on. Mm -hmm. um, now, then there's a lot of people who uh, may not have any of this stuff and they may actually have polyps. Uh, there are certain things within the gut that you just don't, you won't have any symptoms of potentially. Um, and that's one of the reasons why we recommend that people over the age of 45 nowadays come in for colon cancer screening, because the only way for us to really know is either take a look or there are some stool tests that we can do that can increase our suspicion for colon cancer or for large polyps. But traditionally people are still coming in for colonoscopies and if you've had a colonoscopy at an age appropriate age, uh, everything checks out, your diet's good, you're not having a whole lot of symptoms, then your gut's probably healthy. Um, but those, that's the way I think about gut health as a gastroenterologist, if that makes any sense. So would you say that somebody who has um, two to three bowel movements a day, do they, is that a sign of a healthier gut? or if it's just in the range, then you're okay. Having bowel movements within normal range is just one aspect of gut health. Um, it's not, it, I wouldn't look at it as the end all be all, okay? Uh, again, if somebody is the age 50 and they've never had a colonoscopy, but they're having normal bowel movements, I don't want them to use normal bowel movements as a reason not to get colonoscopy because you could still have polyps. Um, and ultimately, uh, someone who's having normal bowel movements, if you just so happen to have normal bowel movements, but you know your diet is unhealthy, uh, that doesn't necessarily mean that you have a healthy combination of bacteria within your gut uh, just because you're having normal bowel movements, okay? So I think people should look at it uh, holistically as opposed to just focusing on, you know, their bowel movements by themselves to define um, them having a healthy gut. All right. Well, thank you, Dr. McDonald, very much again for your time. Um, thank you so much, Dr. McDonald, for your time and your knowledge. We definitely appreciate learning more about cannabis and how it affects the gut and how to have a healthy gut. Again, thank you for our viewers for watching and be healthy out there. Make sure you have a healthy gut and a healthy diet.